Alright, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Alright. Let's start. Alright, All right, let's, let's begin. Uh, welcome to the Darwin Cook Spotlight Panel here at WonderCon. As previously noted, Mr. Darwin Cook himself right here. And we'll introduce ourselves in case you're not aware who we are, because we're nobody. I'm Ron Richards. I'm Connor Kilpatrick. And I'm Josh Flanagan. And together we co-founded a little thing called Life Fanboy back in the day, which um, Connor and Josh are still... Uh, we met a couple of people who don't know who you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Then I, I, I stepped away a couple years ago to go work at Image Comics, but Connor and Josh were still new in the podcast. But one of the highlights of our tenure during iFanboy has been our numerous interviews with Darwin. <laughs> when I found out uh, they were going to give me a spotlight panel, I, 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 you know, it, they, can, they can get boring. And it got me thinking, well, you know, the boys are all still down there. Maybe we'll all get together for... One last interview. Uh, I, <laughs> We're getting too old for this shit. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, uh, you know, when I was getting going in the business, uh, these three guys were were nice enough to uh, who have read and paid some attention to me. So uh, we forged an early relationship, and we've had a lot of laughs along the way. So I thought this would be a good way for us to uh, kill the hour. And I'd like to note that you were well established in your career before we came along. We were lucky enough that you talked to us. Well, you were you you were all pretty cute back then, you know. Um, that was a long time ago, but you were yeah, you were like three Jimmy Olsons, you know, With your little notepads and those days have passed. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Uh, we've eaten up time. Let's uh, let's start with. We should lay down the ground rules. No softballs. This is the tough questions. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, so I hope you're ready. Oh. Uh, so we spent a lot of time going. Well, we don't want we don't want them to come back at us on that. So let's just start with a big one. If you're looking at comics today, you're looking at the landscape of the comics industry. Where is it that you see yourself fitting into it? Uh, jeez, I, I don't know that I actually do. Um, if we're talking about mainstream comics, uh, I, I think there have been a lot of real tactical errors made in uh, this century. And, uh, you know, we're at a point where um, I can't really read superhero comics anymore because they're not about superheroes. They're, um, they've become so dark and violent and uh, sexualized. Uh, and I, I, I think it's a real wrong turn. Um, I don't know how a company like Warner Brothers or Disney is able to rationalize um, characters raping and murdering and taking drugs and carrying on the swearing and carrying on the way they do. And, and those same characters are on sheet sets for five-year-olds and pajamas and cartoons, and I, th I think there's a really odd and schizophrenic thing that, that's happened. Um, within the industry, I think everybody's writing books for themselves, and you know, the median age of a creator is probably between 35 and 50 right now. And, you know, once they abandoned the notion that uh, these characters were all ages characters, they've really limited the market you know, and we're at a point with digital delivery where, you know, if a Spider-Man book was an all-ages book and it cost 99 cents to download the thing, you know, if, if they made a real effort in that regard, who knows, they might be able to get back to a point where they had two, three million readers a month. Um, but now, look, you know, the best-selling book is struggling to, to sell 100,000 copies, you know? Um, 60,000 is considered a, a great number. And... You know, I've said this before, but you go back, in 1972, Jimmy Olsen Comics sold a quarter of a million copies a month. And that wasn't enough to keep it alive. It was canceled, because those numbers weren't good enough. Um, so we've managed to shrink the business down to a point, and how do you grow out of it? And how do you come back from it? Once you bring characters like the Justice League into, into storylines that involve things like rape, threesomes, um, and this kind of nonsense. Um, how do you how do you step back? 
And I'm really hoping to see Disney or Warner's. I think the smartest thing, the bravest and smartest thing one of these companies could do would be to scrap everything they're doing and bring in, bring in creative people who have the talent and the are willing to put in the effort it takes to write an all-ages universe that an adult or a child could enjoy. And I, th I think if either one of these companies was smart enough to do that, I think they, they could take, take huge strides uh, for the industry. Now, outside of those two companies, I think that's where I, I see myself fitting in the future. Um, DC only brings me in when they want the old, timey, happy stuff, you know? It's like, it's like a novelty to them. Um, so you'll notice I don't do a lot of work for DC, and they simply, they don't ask me. I've never been asked in, in the 15 years I've worked for them if I wanted to do a regular book, if I wanted to try uh, introducing a new character. Um, they, they simply have no spot for me, you know, in their day-to-day -day operations, so I kind of work around the edges of it. Here's why I love you. You answered about five of our questions in that one answer. Excellent. <laughs> you really, we're ahead of the game. Really man. hamstrung us here. All right, thanks uh, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, well, I, I kind of want to go back because there's actually one question that in all of our interviews we never asked you, and I'm kind of curious. Okay. So th we know the story of your career that you worked in advertising, you worked in you know other in other animation things like that before breaking into comics in the 99, 2000, but you were published in '85. In yeah. show, showcase number nineteen, or talent showcase number nineteen. Yes. How did that happen? And then what happened after that? I, you know, it, it's hard to think about right now. But you think back to nineteen eighty-three. I guess when I was, you know, uh, no, actually it would be about nineteen eighty. Uh, I was very young, um, 19, I suppose, and I knew I wanted to do comics. And uh, DC had created a book called New Talent Showcase, where they would run short stories from new talent. And I lived in Canada. Now, you, you gotta keep in mind, back then there's no FedEx, there are no cell phones, there's no internet, there are no fax machines. You, you had to mail things, and you had to use a regular telephone. But most people didn't even have answering machines. Um, so I ended up flying to New York with my sample story to see if I could get some work at DC. and. Uh, I met with Sal Amendola, the editor of New Talent Showcase, and he really liked the work, but it was a crime story I'd done. I hadn't done a superhero story. And uh, it was one of the greatest moments of my career. Uh, he was looking at my work and talking with me, and Julie Schwartz, one of the greatest editors uh, in the business, walked in to talk to Sal about something. And Sal showed him my work and said, Julie, look at this kid, he's really good but he doesn't do the capes, you know? So what can we do with this kid? And Julie said, buy this. And they bought my sample and gave me a voucher. And I, I can remember stepping out onto the street in New York going, oh my God. <laughs> did, did you jump like Mary I, Tyler Moore? I birds? was literally Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> and yeah, I can remember running to a pay phone and feeding quarter after quarter into it to phone my parents and say, hey, I got the job, I got the job. And that was it. After that, nothing. Um, back then, there was no way to get regular work at a New York publisher unless you were in the New York area. And uh, for two years, I tried my best to, to find a way in, and there just wasn't. Um, so I had to sort of give up on it, because I needed to make a living. And that's when I got involved in the other things I did, up until, uh, you know, later, 18 years later, when I uh, finally got Batman Ego uh, through at DC. And so then, at that point, I mean, did you always intend to try to go back, or did you come to terms with, okay, well, I'm not going to do comics, I'm going to do other stuff? Yeah, I'd come to terms with the fact that I probably wasn't going to do it, and uh, I, would, I would do comics wherever I could. You know, I, I used to art direct a magazine, so we had a subscription page every month to get people to subscribe. And I would draw a comic strip for it every month. I'd come up with a different thing, and I'd kind of keep my hand in in that way. And then it was, frankly, it was the, the image boom, you know, when all the guys left Marvel. 
um, and the, the whole industry kind of, you know, revved up in an insane way. And by then, there were ways to work with people in New York. And I thought, you know what, I should give this another try. What also, was well, what was it that brought you back? I mean, was it always, what is it about the medium that brings you back, I guess is the question. Well, you know, we're all here. We all love this medium. And, you know, I always love to draw. I, you know, I, film and books and television were all a huge part of my life. But, you know, I was, and again, I can't stress this enough. If you were 13 years old in 1973, 74, and you were still reading comic books, your parents wanted to get you in to see a therapist. You were considered, there was something wrong with you if you were still reading comic books at that age. And you, you couldn't like read one on the bus or you'd be ridiculed. So it was almost like a secret, it was almost like pornography at that point. Um, to be caught with comic books when you're 13. It's kind of cooler then. But <laughs> Yeah, back then, honestly, if you were 13 and, and you got caught with a copy of Penthouse, you'd, you'd get off easier than you would with a copy of a Batman comic. More it depends on what you, you like, though. Yeah. <laughs> I'll scramble to that joke. <laughs> Josh? Um, so we were talking last night, and we thought, is he done with Parker? And we didn't know. So we went to the back of the book, and it said... Parker will return in 2015. At the back of Slate Ground. Yeah, at the back of Slate Ground, the, the last volume. So where are we at with Parker? Well, 2015 is a lie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we know. Um, you should put 2015 in quotes. There will be more Parker. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, you know, again, I'll get you a straight up answer. You know, I was so excited about the Parker work and so thrilled to be doing it. And, and it, it, it actually was successful. I was supposed to do four books over eight years. That was the contract. And I ended up doing four books in four years. And the problem was, by the time we got to the fourth book, there, there's a point where you start to become that thing that's just there. Um, and you know, all the excitement or anticipation had gone out of it, I think. And uh, there are people, this weekend I've been talking to friends of mine, they go, there's a fourth one? Um, so I thought, you know what, it'd be a good idea to put the brakes on for a couple of years and just let people maybe um, miss them a bit before uh, we get back to it. And I am not sure, there might be two more, there might only be one more. Um, and then who knows what the future holds, because frankly, I, you know, I can see Parker and I getting along, you know, for as long as I can hold a pencil. Um, but but he will return, but it probably won't be till 2016. You still have a hunger to do it, though. Oh yeah, I, it's uh, you know we were talking on another panel um, on Friday, and I was with a bunch of artists, and I said, you know, we all have careers, we all have jobs that we we pick up as we go, and whatever job you do, you try to put a bit of yourself into it. You try to find a way to. To, to make it something meaningful to you. But over the course of your career, maybe once, twice if you're lucky, you're given that one job you knew you were born to do, or the one thing that was abs that is absolutely the perfect thing for you, for your voice, and you know, definitely Parker's that for me. So looking at the latest volume at Slayground, uh, you've talked a lot about the, I know with the man with the getaway face, you how you fit the, the various Westlake stories to adapt them to graphic novels. Slayground felt faster, like a faster read than the other ones. Um, That's because it's got less pages, you idiot. <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> I was counting at home. 20 minutes. Well, no, honestly, right. No, but I mean, the, the, cha the challenge of choosing what material and how to adapt it. Right. You know. Slayground uh, is an interesting book. It's my favorite book out of the entire series uh, because it's the one book where uh, we see Parker in these books in all kinds of situations, uh, pulling all kinds of robberies. But Slayground is the one book where he's left alone with nothing but his wits. And he's trapped in a spot where there are two, two groups of really bad people trying, trying to find him and kill him. And he's got nothing but his, his brain and the things he can find you know, on the ground uh, to pull him out of it. So it's, it's an amazing book, but it didn't have the depth of character or backstory or the need to be as long as the other ones. 
And the last one I'm going to do is going to be Butcher's Moon, which is probably you know the masterpiece out of out of the, the books. And you can't do Butcher's Moon without Slayground because they connect. Um, Butcher's Moon uh, addresses things that happen in Slayground. So I knew I had to do it, but I I thought you know this is more of a a roller coaster ride than than it is uh, you know. Um, a complex or, or, or layered piece of work. So I decided to go with something shorter and faster. So the first story you sold at DC was a crime story. Parker's a crime story. Revengeance, which we're going to talk about in a bit, is a crime story. You're, you're known as a crime guy. But knowing you, you're also really into space. Do you ever feel like you have a sci-fi story or something like that in you? Or is it all? do you really just gravitate towards crime? No, I. you know, one of the things, it's like... It, it, being involved in enter, entertainment medium, I refuse to call what I do art. You know, I, I think I'm an entertainer. If there's art to be found, uh, you know, someone else can sort that out later. Um, if you end up good at something, then that's what you do. That's who you are. Uh, you tend to get typecast, and, and I'm not bitching about that. You know, I feel very lucky, but um, you do. You tend to not get offered work unless it's something you've done before. DC never calls me up to do anything different. They call me up when they need a Silver Age riff or an old timey thing. And uh, other than that, I get offered crime work. And it's like Grant Morrison wanted me to work on Multiversity. So of course he offered me the story of the Golden Age heroes that, you know, and I, I wrote him a very nice thank you, you know, I'd love to work with you someday, but I'm not doing any more of that. And, and you know, I've already done it. So if you were to come back at me, Grant, with something like The Filth or uh, We Three or Sea Guy, you know, then sure, I, I, you know, I would love to dive in with you, but I, I certainly don't want to be that guy, you know, and I am that guy. So <laughs> uh, trying to break out of that mold can be difficult. And, uh, you know, the crime stuff is just, it is, it's my favorite type of fiction, my favorite type of film, but you, you mentioned science fiction in space, and all I can do is broadly hint that next year, me and somebody are doing something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yes, yes we are. And uh, You heard it, he will continue to make something. I loved you in that thing I saw you in. Um, so yeah, no, next year I'm working with uh, somebody I, I never would have dreamed I'd have the chance to work with, and we're actually doing a contemporary science fiction story. Well, that kind of leads to the topic of collaboration. Yeah, so we, we read a bunch of interviews in pre preparation, which oh. anyone who knows us knows that's unusual. <laughs> yeah, reading. Um, <laughs> Ding! Uh, in a bunch of the interviews, you talk about how much you love to collaborate with other writers, but your stuff you're best known for, Parker, and your Frontier Spirit, it's all stuff you wrote. There's sort of a disconnect there. Well, it's... I was lucky that when I did get my second chance to get back in this business, I, I had a lot of understanding of the way things work. And I, you know, I, I, getting back into comics, I was reading everything about everything. And it became clear that at the time I was breaking in, it's a writer's medium. And that the writers controlled uh, the books and the approach and the way things were being done. And, and at that point, I had only considered being an artist, but I thought, you know what? I should try to write as well, because if I can, then I'm, I'm going to be able to control my destiny a little better. You know, usually you break into the business, and then they'll give you a book like Blue Devil to do for a year, and you cut your teeth on that, and you're given a script, and you draw it, and you, you hope you're going to get something better. And I was already an old man, and I thought, I've got to find a way to leap past that part of this. So by writing my own material, it gave me it gave me that much more control and the ability to guide, you know, what I did. So I, I sort of did it because it just seemed like the smartest way um, to get where I wanted to go as quickly as I could. Um, and, and, and that has a lot to do with it. But yeah, uh, working with a great writer is, is a real pleasure, you know? Um, and I was lucky early on, I got to work with Brew Baker uh, on Catwoman. And uh, you know, we're, we're great friends to this day. 
that was just you know a perfect combination the two of us and the other the other guy I got to work with back then that really uh, impressed me was Peter Milligan on X Force and Peter's actually the only writer I've ever worked with where I haven't ripped apart at least part of the script and decided that it should be something different you know and it, it, to be able to sit down and just at every point go yeah that's perfect that's perfect yeah I get that I get that um, yeah it can be a real pleasure but uh, you know, collaboration is a huge part of what I do. You know, even if the guy's not in the room with you, like when I did the Spirit, I'm I'm working with Will Eisner. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not trying to abandon his his work. I was trying to find a way to to bring that to a new audience. So even though he wasn't there, he's kind of there at the table with me. And the same is true with Parker. It's not like I wrote that stuff out of my head. I'm, I'm working with another writer's work. And, and while we may not be on the phone talking about it, because I don't have a phone for the dead, um, he's there with me, you know? Uh, we are collaborating. So actually, if you really look at it, I, I don't think I've done very much work on my own. So what do you consider yourself to be? A cartoonist. I love that word. You know, there's this uh, real dick in the business, a writer I know, a real dickhead. And, uh, uh, God, we got into it about all of this one time through the email. And uh, he sent me an email saying, who the fuck do you think you are? Blah, blah, blah. Who gives, what gives you the right to blah, blah, blah? Who the fuck do you think you are? And I just wrote back, I'm, in a, I'm a cartoonist, asshole. <laughs> I do what you do, plus four times more than that. I have an entire skill set and lifetime of, of ability that, that you don't even understand. You're a writer. I'm a cartoonist. That's who I think I am. I'm going to follow that. Oh. <laughs> so, speaking of collaboration and working on other things, you are actually not, you don't have a lot of creator-owned stuff, and we're in a time of burgeoning creator-owned stuff everywhere, and I, I know you'll be doing uh, work with Image, but there hasn't been a lot of it. Have you been, what's your take on that? Where do you stand on it? Um, it's, it's just been a matter of a, uh, delay after delay after delay. Uh, if we go back to, I think it was 2005 when I did Solo for DC. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with Solo. Okay. Um, uh, if you look on the back cover of Solo, you'll see a picture of Slam Bradley walking away into the distance. And that was going to be my last mainstream book. I was, at that point, I was going to go into creator own and start doing my own work. And the problem is they keep dangling these shiny things in front of you, you know? And I remember I was like three weeks into getting my own thing together and I got the call saying, look, we're doing the spirit. And if it's not you, it's, you know, it's going to be somebody. And it was like, God, I can't let this go. And, you know, you, you also get into this, you know, ego thing, like, if it's got to be me. Whoever else does this is going to screw it up. <laughs> so, you know, next thing you know, two, two years go by. And then there was the whole Watchmen shit show, right? And, and again, it was like something I'd never thought of doing. But once the opportunity came up, it was such a, you know, monumental challenge uh, that it was like hard to say no to it. And Parker was my first step into this area we're talking about. And, and again, I'm a pragmatic guy, and I know a lot of friends who do incredible creator-owned work. And at, at that point, in 08, 09, you'd see them doing these brilliant books that were selling 3,000 copies, 4,000 copies. And I thought, if I'm going to break into this area, I'm going to go in there with somebody. And that's when the Parker thing all pulled together in my head. I thought, you know, if I can go into this with Donald's audience and my audience, between the two of them, we can probably not lose money on the thing. And so, you know, that was my first step. And I got so carried away with Parker, you know, that these other things have kind of just been sitting and percolating. And there have been things that just didn't happen. You know, I, I, I had a story idea about four years ago that I still, I, I, 
I, I have it, you know, sitting at home, and I love the thing, and I came up with the idea, and I thought, you know, I'm not the guy to draw this. Paul Pope's got to draw this. You know, Paul's a buddy of mine. So I, I send him the story, and he writes me this long email back telling me how great he thinks it is, and at the end he says, I really hate drawing cars and motorcycles, so no, I, uh, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know... Uh, these things end up sitting around and accumulating. And uh, actually, Revengeance, uh, four years ago, Tim Sale phoned me and wanted me to write a book for, for Tim. And uh, I'd come up with this story that I thought was perfect for him, and he loved it. And Tim being Tim, he said, oh, I just got to finish up Cap for Marvel, and we'll get right on this. <laughs> so last week, uh, a buddy saw him at Emerald City, and he said, tell Darwin I'm almost done Cap, and then we're going to get to that. So it's like five years ago. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was five years ago. Um, and when I realized it's like now or never, I'm, I'm going to do this, when I looked at everything I had, um, that was the story I, that appealed to me the most. And uh, I, I told Tim, sorry, man, <laughs> I'm taking this one for myself. So. So, I mean, probably we put, here's the image that we showed in the Image Expo earlier this year um, for Revengeance. It's cut off, though. I'm sorry. That's all right. But um, for those who might not have heard about it, what, so what is Revengeance? What, what can we look forward to with, with this title? Well, I think the title kind of indicates that it's, I'm not taking it entirely seriously. Um, it's a, I don't know if anybody out there has read the Mickey Spillane book, I, the Jury. Uh, the first Mike Hammer novel. He, yes. Uh, the whole book is about him swearing he's going to find the guy who did this horrible thing and he's going to kill him. And this is basically the same story, except it's the story of a young, liberal, nonviolent sort of party guy who ends up having something so horrible happen he makes the same promise. He's going to find who did it and kill them. The thing is, he hasn't got any clue how to do that. <laughs> and so the, the whole book is his odyssey uh, to try to become a guy who's tough enough uh, to, to track this, this person down and, and kill them. He just he hasn't got any clue how to go about it. And so it's, uh, it's, it's incredibly dark. The ending of it is horribly dark. But on the way, it's, it's, I like to think there's going to be a lot of hilarious stuff about this, uh, you know, <laughs> milk toast kind of playboy uh, kid uh, becoming this, this hardened badass. It's set in the 80s, right? Yes, it is. 1986 Toronto? Yes, it's a classic write-what-you-know scenario. Uh, I grew up in Toronto, and I, my 20s were the 80s, and uh, I, worked in, I was a magazine art director and graphic designer. And I thought, you know, what a perfect backdrop for the story. And uh, so there's a lot of me in it, and what I did was I just kind of subtracted everything decent about me and made everything bad about me twice as bad. <laughs> um, and that's kind of how I got my character. And, and once I put him into that world that I know, uh, I could see all the potential and, and, and how I could make it work. So uh, we have a page. We have some art from it. Not Just, a page, but some art. Some, uh, do you guys want to see some never-before-seen art from Revengeance? Yeah? It's just a little sketch. Yeah. But, uh, and believe it or not, that's how I used to dress in the 80s. Uh, I believe I, it. I, yeah, I wore these giant suits that were like four sizes too big for me. Back then, you could go to, um, you know, the Salvation Army or the Goodwill, and there'd be all these great suits from the 50s for like $2 a piece. And the shirts were like 50 cents, ties were three for a dollar. So I'd go in there with $20 and come out with my fall wardrobe. <laughs> And yeah, back then, you know, the pants came up to your nipples and, uh, you know, a lot of linen, you had to iron it a lot, you know, it, it was the Miami Vice era. And so, uh, you know, I didn't run around in white pants and pink blazers, but, but I definitely was wearing all that big boxy stuff. And all the signs in the background there, those are all real places uh, in Toronto. Most of them are still around, but, but they were all real hot places uh, back in the day. Um, so it's just a, 
a little taste. I, I hate showing story or pages or, or getting too deep into it. Uh, you know, I think a lot of guys kind of ruin um, the reader's experience by telling them too much before the, the actual books come out. So I thought it was interesting. So the other night we were having dinner and I asked you kind of when you're working on something that you're on, when you're being the true cartoonist, what your process is, um, whether you go full script and then draw or whatever, or if you, you know, it evolves. And I found it, fa your answer fascinating. So do you want to share with everyone your, your kind of process? I'll keep it quick. I, I find these kind of questions <laughs> must bore the shit out of the audience. But um, what I'll do is, uh, you know, I won't write a full script for myself. I mean, I don't have to describe the room in words for me because I can draw it. Uh, so what I'll usually do is write up one sheet you know, that explains the story to myself, a sentence for each scene. And then I'll draw lines between them all and go, okay, I've got 28 pages and I'll figure out how many pages each of those scenes should be. And then I sit down and I draw the book. And I just think it's a great way to go because uh, while I'm drawing it, I'm able to think, I know what the characters are, their exchange is, and, and how the scene's gotta end up. And instead of having the words locked in, I'll, I'll draw them acting through their exchanges. And while I'm drawing it, I've got hours to think about what they might say. They could say this, they could say that. Uh, four hours into it, something hits you and you go, oh geez, that's perfect. And I'll just make a little note. And then once I've got the entire story visually uh, in front of me, then I go back and I'll put the words in. And the other great thing about that is, you know, writers will write, you know, those 40 word captions. And, and once the thing's drawn, you can see, well, you know what, I don't have to describe this. We don't need words here. This would be a wonderful silent moment. Um, oh, gee, I have to actually write a little more dialogue here because this isn't as clear as I would want it to be. And I think you're able to create a more seamless uh, and, and more pure uh, comic book experience, you know, less like a novel or, or a film, because it, I don't know, it just works best for me. I haven't talked to a ton of creators and never heard an answer like that. I like that a lot. Just um, anyway, so, so let's. Well, before we let me get yeah, plugged okay. in, so Revengeance will be coming from Image Comics. You can flew over to that, and we look. We're very excited to be working together with Darwin. So uh, yeah, he's going to edit it. He and uh, he, he, yeah. Yeah. so Ron's my editor, and uh, the other night I was asking him, you know, why he was nervous about it, and he lied to me. He said, "Well, I'm afraid I'll let you down." He wouldn't give me an honest answer, and uh, he was worried about certain aspects of it. And I said, "Look, you're familiar with my work, and I assume you know how to read." <laughs> So you're qualified. He can't spell, but he can read. <laughs> you're qualified to be an editor. Hey, find me one editor who can spell. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, quick, quick, I, I swear to God this happened. I, I did a book. I'm not going to name the book or the situation, but uh, I wrote and drew it. The book came out, and there was all kinds of stuff on message boards. This is pre-Twitter, about spelling mistakes and grammar problems in the book. And the editor of the book phones me up furious, going, what is wrong with you, man? All these typos and spelling mistakes. <laughs> and I said to him, are, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, because I came from magazines and journalism where you had copy editors everywhere, fact checkers. And uh, you know, we got to a point in the conversation, and I said, don't you have a copy editor in the office? And his answer was, yeah, we do, but I never take her anything. Every time I take a book to her, she comes back and she's got changes. It's a real pain in the ass. I swear to God, that, that's a real answer. And, 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 Is yeah. that person still working? Is he working? He's a vice president. <laughs> There you go. So, um, speaking of shit shows, your word, um, you'd mentioned Watchmen, and... <laughs> I mean, how would we not ask about that? Well, it, it happened for some reason, and you were involved with it. Sure. What, what's your takeaway from that after? Like, what do you have to say about Watchmen if somebody asks you about it now? It's a, it's a sensitive topic, let's face it. I, you know, it was the first time I'd ever been on the ass end of like 
you know, the internet deciding you're evil, uh, you know, and my takeaway from it is it's really easy to think that 40 people on the internet are the whole planet. This would probably be my takeaway. You know, there were guys that just beat on that night and day for a year. And if you look at it, you know, every day my wife would get up and she's reading these things, oh, die in a fire, he ought to be, you know, and, and you think, wow, you know. Um, it's amazing the degree to which a, a certain vocal minority, uh, you know, are able to uh, color your opinion of yourself or affect your approach uh, to the work you do. Um, you know, outside of that, and, and I, you know, it doesn't matter what I say, you know, everything I say here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take shit for it one way or another. Um, I always loved Watchmen as a book, but I never thought it was all that the greatest book, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, I thought it was an immensely brilliant, you know, deconstruction, um, but it was never the holy grail to me, so I, I don't think I ever looked at it that way as the project evolved, and you see, you know, for some people it's, it means a great deal to them, and the, the fact that you're not able to say, see it the same way they do, uh, you know, can be really problematic. So when you were approached about it, did you think, like, did you have the, oh, I shouldn't do this? Or did you think, oh, yes. what is Alan going to think? No. Or did you just go, oh, that'd be fun, sure. I've never given five seconds thought to what Alan Moore thinks. I'm <laughs> telling, and I'm just being honest. Um, I, I think Alan, you know, maybe on a good day could step back and see that a lot of the things he says, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, <laughs> maybe are a little hard on the rest of the industry. Um, but no, I never, I never stopped to think about that. What I did stop to think about was, uh, and I did say no. I said no for two years, I believe, um, because I just couldn't imagine uh, anything I could do that would measure up. Uh, not just to the book, but the, the book's cumulative reputation in the industry. Um, and then, pursued me for a couple years about this. Every time I'd see him, he'd bring it up again, and I'd say no again. And uh, then I remember, you know, there, there was this day, and I don't know anyone who's read Minute Men, it, I'll spoil it for those who didn't. I came up with the notion that um, Hooded Justice was killed by the comedian and it's the comedian who was behind all the really bad stuff that happened to the Minutemen. And when I, when I had that idea in my head, then it all clicked over and I went, holy Jesus, this, this will work? And then I actually phoned Dan up and I said, if this is still on the table, you know, I'm in. And uh, they, they wanted me to write all the books at first. So did we. Well. <laughs> 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 and, uh, you know, I, I, I said absolutely not, and uh, we got to a point where they actually wanted me to do three of them, and I, even that was too much, and I managed to get uh, Joe Straczynski uh, to take Night Owl, they'd wanted me to do Night Owl, and I, that left Silk Spectre. And I, generally, when I don't want to do something, I'll make an irrational demand to, to try to get myself out of it. And uh, so when they came to me about that, I said, okay, I want to do it like a, a 60s romance comic, when she's like 15, 16. It's going to take place in Hate ashbury There's going to be a lot of drugs. And I'm not going to do it unless I get to do it with Amanda Connor. And you're going to have to pay her to co-write it because I need a woman's voice to make this work. And I thought, this will kill it, because Amanda won't touch this thing. She's one of my best friends, you know, it's like a calculated risk. <laughs> and uh, they said, wow, great idea. <laughs> and Amanda said, wow, great idea. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I guess I'm doing Silk Spectre too. Um, but you know, that's much more Amanda's book. Uh, you know, uh, I think it was her first time out, you know, writing a big book. Uh, so uh, I thought if we were there co-writing it, you know, that would, that would uh, allow her to, to relax and really be able to get into it. Five minutes left uh, already. No, oh, that sucks. Someone was late. I, w I wasn't late. I, I was right on time. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Well, 
All right. <laughs> Why am I in charge all of a sudden? I got, you got you. Let me, I think what's interesting is we've. we've <laughs> <laughs> I have to talk into the microphone. microphone. Um, what's interesting, and this may be longer than a five-minute question, but we, we're talking about a lot of books, a lot of companies, but there's nothing from Marvel in any of this. Well, you mentioned X-Force. Right. Well, I got, I'm getting to that. So that was 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, basically, do you guys all remember a, a line of books called Marvel Adventures, like their kids' line? Marvel uh, got in touch with me, solicited me to develop that line for them, and I did. And I put together like a, a strategic deck, a business plan, uh, the line of books. I brought in the other guys. I, I have so much artwork at home, you, you would not believe it. They took it all. They said, this is fantastic. This is amazing. This is a home run. And then they never called me again. And they handed it off to a bunch of other guys. And uh, that was the end of my relationship with Marvel. And uh, yeah, uh, as long as Marvel is who it is right now, uh, I, I really, you know, I, I can't. Like, I, I, I can't work for them. Okay, Ron, questions? <laughs> By the way, where are the drinks? There's supposed to be booze here. I was supposed to, I was supposed to make these guys drink today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so, because we're running out of time, there is a question that I've had, and, I'm thinking about, and you've said all, lots of times, you broke in later. Yeah. You know, you're, you're no spring chicken. Um, no. Well, I mean, I'm saying, Thanks for noticing. You can punch though. him, by the way. Yeah. That's a lot. No, I absolutely relate to this, so it works. Like, at this point, what drives you to work in comics, to want to keep making comics? Because The opportunity to talk to bright, eager, young scientists <laughs> like yourself. <laughs> That's what keeps me in comics. That's the one thing I would call the bullshit answer. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing like comics, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I've spent enough time in Hollywood when I worked at Warner Brothers um, that I know what it means. Like, if, if you're going to commit to a movie, it, that's five years of your life. And it's probably going to be five crappy years of your life, and the movie may never get made, and, and even if it does, it might be garbage. Um, and I, I am no spring chicken. So with comic books, I'm able to, to you know, create that kind of fully realized experience without having to uh, you know, go to all that miserable trouble. <laughs> Comics is like the only place where you know, one man can sit down and put an entire visual story together all on his own and get it out to market for less than like 80 million dollars. I was gonna, everyone was gonna have a double shot, but I'm gonna go easy on you guys because it's late in the day now. <laughs> we usually do this at nine in the morning. The, the first time these guys uh, video interviewed me, I think, uh, they were all very eager and it was late at night and we were out at the bar and I said, all right, I'll do it. But you guys have to be there at nine. No, 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 no. no, 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 no. no, no. The line was. The exact words are. are okay. okay. Wait, wait. So, so it's we're at the Isotope in San Francisco, and there's there's lines. It's a huge party. The place is completely packed. We are hovering around like scared little children. We get, we're going to talk to Darwin. It's going to do three hours. Three doing. hours. We're sweaty. We're waiting for it. We finally get up to there because he's been gracious with all the people who came to see him, and we present the idea to him. No one can hear or speak anymore, and he just goes, "No, do you bitches have the stones to meet us at 9 a.m. tomorrow?" <laughs> <laughs> Drink in hand, pointing. Do you bitches have the stones? And we're like, truth or no, cook? No, and I'll never forget it. I looked at Josh, I looked at Connor, I looked at Darwin, I go, yes, sir, we do. <laughs> <laughs> they were Jimmy Olsen's, I swear. And so, yeah, uh, when we got together, I, I made them all drink. It was like 9 in the morning. I said, no, I'm not answering any questions until you all drink. So. At 9.30, by the way, <laughs> just a note. So in honor of that auspicious day. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, I got, I'm still working. <laughs> I've never even had whiskey before. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, that well, gets us to the end, I think. Are yeah. We done? Um, By the way, uh, these are three of the greatest guys uh, you know you could ever meet in the business, and uh, I wish them all the best. And clearly, Darwin Cook is one of the greatest creators, and we're all lucky to have him in comics. So let's hear it for Darwin.
Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks, Check for, out thanks a lot, guys. I hope it was fun. Check out Revengeance at a comic store near you soon. <laughs> Daniel Craig wore the girl with the dragon tattoo. Really? And he's got a better body than I do, though. <laughs> and then I watched him drive them on accident, so they're like, never, never drive. they're way more tight than I'm supposed to be, and I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. I want it to be known that when we look at our phones, it's because we put our notes on here, and not because we're like, what else is going on? Because that would be rude. We have dongles. We have dongles. All right, so, um, so they're trying to get out from the board. We're over dongle. We've hit dongle saturation. We can't reconcile ourselves to the shotgun at this point. But, uh, okay, well, let me, let me get the hands out. Yeah. We want what? We've saturated our dongles. Yeah, we're starting to wrinkle. Thank you.